We begin this morning with the major revelations coming out of the first public hearing into the January 6th Capitol insurrection. The House committee investigating the attack went into graphic detail on the results of a year-long investigation. More than a thousand witnesses were interviewed with nearly a hundred subpoenas issued and hundreds of tips rolling in. The bipartisan House committee is arguing that former President Trump was responsible for the attack on the Capitol. For the first time, we heard from some of the people closest to the former president, videotaped testimony from his aides and allies, and we got a better idea of what went down on Capitol Hill and in the White House on January 6, 2021. We have full coverage this morning, but first, here are some of the biggest moments from last night's hearing, and we do want to warn you, some of the video you're about to see may be hard to watch. I'm from a part of the country where people justify the actions of slavery, the Ku Klux Klan, and lynching. I'm reminded of that dark history as I hear voices today try and justify the actions of the insurrectionists on January 6, 2021. Mr. Chairman, at 6.01 p.m. on January 6th, after he spent hours watching a violent mob besiege, attack, and invade our capital, Donald Trump tweeted, but he did not condemn the attack. Trump asked us to come. He personally asked for us to come to D.C. that day. Most of the footage we are about to play has never been seen. They're marching eastbound towards the United States Capitol. We just had folks in a deep circle, breach the line. We need backup. What I saw was just a, a war scene. There were officers on the ground. They were bleeding. They were throwing up. And I saw friends with blood all over their faces. I was slipping in people's blood. It was carnage. It was chaos. And aware of the rioters' chance to hang Mike Pence, the president responded with this sentiment, quote, maybe our supporters have the right idea. They dared to question my honor. They dared to question my loyalty. And they dared to question my duty. I am a proud American, and I will gladly sacrifice everything to make sure that the America my grandfather defended is here for many years to come. Tonight, I say this to my Republican colleagues who are defending the indefensible. There will come a day when Donald Trump is gone, but your dishonor will remain. To get more on all of this, we do have team coverage with NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli, former U.S. attorney and NBC News contributor Chuck Rosenberg, and Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa. And Ali, we're going to start with you. This committee brought forward evidence that had not yet been made public, including testimony from former President Trump's inner circle, even his own daughter, Ivanka. So what did we hear from those who were near Trump on January 6th? Yeah, Joe, well, nearly a year ago now, the committee really made a promise to gather all the evidence available to be able to prove that the deadly attack on the Capitol on January 6th was more than just uh, the incitement of this mob by a few bad actors. They want to prove that this was a conspiracy planned and fueled by the former president and his allies to overturn the results of the 2020 election, even after he had been told that his claims, his repeated claims of fraud uh, had been false. So yesterday, the the committee really laid this out, and he they let the uh, members of the former members of Trump's uh, inner circle lay this out themselves. Listen to a little bit of the testimony, the pre-recorded testimony presented last night by former Attorney General Bill Barr, as well as uh, Trump's daughter Ivanka Trump. I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was bullshit, and. Uh, you know, I didn't want to be a part of it. How did that affect your perspective about the election when Attorney General Barr made that statement? It affected my perspective. Um, I respect Attorney General Barr. Um, so I accepted what he said was saying. 
And this was an effective strategy by the committee by letting these former members of Trump's inner circle speak for themselves as to what they witnessed and what they believed in the aftermath of January 6th, because this committee, as we know, has been uh, attacked as being uh, politicizing this whole issue by Republicans for almost a year now. Ali, we also had new testimony in person, not on video, from a Capitol Police officer as well as a filmmaker who provided some of that new footage we saw last night. What was it they saw on January 6th? What role are they playing in these hearings? So the committee played a long video, a sort of montage of clips that we uh, saw a little bit of at the top there. Uh, and after we saw that video, really the room was visibly shaken, visibly changed after that. And then we heard from two people who were actually there that day, who witnessed this firsthand. The first one was a man named Nick Quested. He was a documentarian who was embedded with the Proud Boys that day. He said he was confused and surprised when he started, started to see hundreds of them marching from the rally on the ellipse in D.C. to the Capitol because he said his assignment for this documentary was to cover this uh, Trump's rally on the ellipse. So he said he was surprised to see how quickly the mob turned violent, uh, turned angry. And then we heard uh, from a Capitol Police officer, Carolyn Edwards, who suffered a concussion after being knocked to the ground when that mob finally uh, uh, attacked that barricade that she was trying to defend. You heard a little bit of her uh, testimony at the top there saying that she just remembers seeing her colleagues, Capitol Police officers, covered in blood trying to defend that front line. So, Alex. The back of my head clipped the concrete stairs behind me. Uh, and you were knocked unconscious, is that right, Officer Edwards? Yes, ma'am. Um, but then when you regained consciousness, even with the injuries, you returned to duty. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, at that time, adrenaline kicked in. I documented the crowd turn from protesters to rioters to insurrectionists. Worth mentioning as well, Joe, the row behind those two uh, witnesses was filled with the family members of Capitol Police officers uh, who died in the aftermath of the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Understandably, uh, they were visibly emotional, uh, crying during during the recalling of this testimony of this attack on the Capitol that day. And Allie, quickly, we know this was just the first hearing. What can we expect from this committee in the coming weeks? So we expect at least five more hearings through the end of the month. Uh, each of them will really have a theme, uh, really laying out the framework, an outline of before, during, and after the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Uh, who was involved? How much uh, White House officials were involved in this? How much they knew about it before it happened, as well as the Justice Department? So we'll hear from several names that we're already familiar with, but we'll also hear from some new names that we didn't know would uh, testify, similar to the two that we heard from last night, uh, stories that the committee thinks does deserve to be told to the American people who are uh, sort of acting as a remote jury uh, while these hearings are going on, uh, coming up with their own conclusion and own opinion of what happened that day. The next meeting scheduled, the next hearing scheduled on Monday. Ali Rafa, thank you so much. Now let's bring in NBC News contributor Chuck Rosenberg. He's a former U.S. attorney and a former FBI senior official. Chuck, thanks so much for joining us on this this morning. So as we watched there, as Ali just laid out, we had family members, inner circle testimony on tape, live testimony from an injured police officer. What to you was the most significant evidence that came out of last night's hearing? And I'm wondering, with the way that it was hyped before, that this could change history, what did you make of what we did learn? Yeah, look, I hope it changes the views of people, Savannah. I hope it changes history, because a lot of people don't accept what happened uh, as factual. And that's deeply dangerous for a democracy. The, in terms of the hearing, I think of it in two different ways. And perhaps a criminal trial is a useful analogy, but certainly not a perfect one, Savannah. There's evidence that's probative, meaning it tends to prove what the president knew, what he intended that he participated in a plot to um, thwart the counting of electoral votes and to impede the Congress and to illegally hold on to power, right? That's probative evidence. And we heard about some of it and more to come. And then there's a different type of evidence. It's compelling or emotional evidence. I thought uh, Officer Caroline Edwards was superb, dignified and honorable mm -hmm. and valiant. But her testimony wasn't probative of what the president knew. But it was certainly compelling. And so, you know, hearings, trials, 
are a combination of those things. And it remains for the committee to do as they promised they would do, which is to prove it. And perhaps we'll see that in the hearings to come. Absolutely. And that officer describing being injured multiple times and continuing to sit, remain on duty that day. Now, last night, we also saw never before seen footage of the riots from that filmmaker who Ali referenced who was documenting the Proud Boys. First, let's listen to some of his testimony. I was surprised at the size of the group, the anger and the profanity. And for anyone who didn't understand how violent that event was, I saw it, I documented it, and I experienced it. Uh, I heard incredibly aggressive chanting, and I shared, subsequently shared that footage with the authorities. How vital is that account? How vital is footage that he took that day to this investigation? And do you think it could potentially change the minds of those who have justified the actions of the Capitol rioters or called it legitimate discourse? Yeah, as to your last question, Savannah, could it change minds? I hope so. I mean, it's right there before our, our, our eyes. It's compelling, as I was talking about earlier. But there are people who just re reject truth. They reject facts. And so I'm not sure that this hearing or additional footage is going to do much for that group of people. But there's also a large group of people who are probably in the middle. Maybe they're tuning in for the first time. Maybe this is the first time they've really paid attention. Mm -hmm. And it could help there. Also, I think at least from a historical perspective, this committee, whether or not they change hearts and minds, are going to make a compelling record of what happened. And that's important, too, right? At least someday, perhaps somebody will want to pay attention to what this former president tried to do to our democracy. For me, I've been paying attention. And so even the new footage didn't seem all that new to me. But it's still compelling. I mean, what happened that day was awful. It was an insurrection. It was an attempt to undermine our democracy. And it was led from the top of the government. And so my heart and my mind is already made up. Mm. And Chuck, quickly, before I let you go, what kind of impact do you think these hearings could have on the criminal investigations into January 6th? Did Congress uncover anything that the FBI maybe already didn't know? Yeah, another great question, Savannah. So I find it hard to believe that um, the FBI and U.S. attorneys um, are not going to be able to do precisely what this Congress did. Mm if that's what they want to do, right? They have subpoena power. They have a grand jury. They have investigative resources that Congress will never have. Does this mean that it's more likely that uh, somebody at the very top will be charged with a seditious conspiracy? I'm not sure. The Department of Justice has to weigh the evidence and make its own prosecutive decision. Congress, of course, doesn't have the authority to prosecute anybody for anything. So that will be an independent decision that the Justice Department will have to make. But they're going to have access to all the information that Congress has and more. Savannah. Chuck Rosenberg, we appreciate your analysis this morning. Thanks for your time. At the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles, President Biden shared his view on the January 6th hearings. One of the things that's going to occupy my country tonight, I suspect, is the first open hearings on January the 6th. And uh, as I said, when it was occurring and subsequent, I think it was a clear, flagrant violation of the Constitution. I think these guys and women broke the law, tried to turn around the result of an election. Let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. He's traveling with the president in L.A. Mike, good morning to you. So how does the president plan to approach these hearings on Capitol Hill? Well, Joe, it was so interesting yesterday because White House officials had indicated that the president might try to find some time to watch last night's hearings. Ultimately, we were watching his activities very closely during the hearing as it began. He was still here at the convention center, ultimately spent much of those next two hours traveling to and then attending a dinner he was hosting for the leaders attending the summit. He told reporters as he was giving a toast at the dinner uh, that he actually didn't have time to watch the hearings. But you heard the president's remarks just then. It was interesting that he went out of his way to bring up the hearings that obviously were going to be capturing the nation's attention last night. Ultimately, some of the very difficult questions that these uh, investigations will prompt will lead to questions for his administration about what they're going to do. It was an interesting split screen yesterday because the president was talking about the importance of shoring up democracies throughout the Western Hemisphere. And very clearly, our own democracy here has its issues here at home that will lead to challenges for the Biden administration moving forward. Let's talk about why you're in L.A. The president has been meeting with leaders at the Summit of the Americas. He's pitching his new economic plan, but it's 
It's off to a rocky start. Some Latin American leaders, they're openly criticizing the U.S. for excluding leftist governments. Other leaders boycotted this summit altogether. So what can you tell us about the talks Biden is having and how are they being received? Yeah, there were a number of tense moments here yesterday, Joe. First, we've talked a lot about the tension building up to the summit about who would be attending. Ultimately, there was a session yesterday where the leaders of both Belize and Argentina, with Biden in attendance, were very critical of the fact that he did not invite certain countries, Cuba and Venezuela, specifically to attend this summit. Though President Biden did listen, did then speak afterwards, he said, notwithstanding some of the disagreements at the summit, he did think there were broadly a lot of agreement, especially about issues like the economy. Listen here to the president pitching his economic vision. When we combine the ability of government to direct economic activity towards specific challenges to help mitigate risk, guard against unfair practices, and create predictable demand with the agility of the private sector, I believe we can deliver real improvement for people's lives. Now, another tense moment yesterday was one of the one-on-one -on -one meetings President Biden had here with other leaders, with President Bolsonaro of Brazil. Biden had to listen very patiently as Bolsonaro did something of a filibuster. Uh, obviously, tensions about Brazil and some of the backsliding in their democracy. The leader of Brazil has even questioned Biden's own election. He was a close friend uh, during his time in office with President Trump. A much different scene when Biden met with Canada's Prime Minister Trudeau, a much warmer session, and ultimately he accepted an invitation to travel to Canada. And Mike, quickly, what's on the agenda today? Well, Joe, it's almost as interesting what's happening outside of the summit for the president as what he's doing here. There will be an announcement about migration, uh, but the president also is going to be doing an event at the economy, traveling to the port of Los Angeles to talk about efforts to combat inflation, a big midterm issue, as we know. And then he's going to be later tonight doing a pair of fundraisers, trying to help his party raise money to get that message out in the fall. Mike Memoli with the president in California. Thank you, Mike. There's new information this morning surrounding the moment police responded to the tragic mass shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. School police chief Pete Arredondo is now sharing what took so long to finally take the gunman down in a bombshell interview with the Texas Tribune. It's the first extended interview the chief has given since the attack happened more than two weeks ago. We're also learning about what was going on inside Robb Elementary during the attack. A new investigation from the New York Times found officers waited to enter the school because they were waiting for protective gear, despite being made aware of the children waiting for help inside. The report is based on law enforcement documents and video, including transcripts of body cam footage obtained by the New York Times. We have one of the Texas Tribune reporters who spoke to Chief Arredondo, Zach Despar, joining us to discuss his extensive reporting. But first, let's bring in NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton from Uvalde with the latest on the investigation. Antonia, good morning. So we want to start by saying that NBC News has not yet verified this New York Times report, which is some of what I was referring to there. But have we learned anything about those moments during the attack? Do we know why the protective gear was more important than entering the building? And is that essentially what this report shows? Good morning, Savannah. That's right. We have not independently confirmed or reviewed the documents seen by the New York Times, but we have at NBC independ independently confirmed uh, the presence of a hellfire trigger there at the scene. This is a device that would have essentially allowed this semi-automatic rifle to become a fully automatic rifle. The evidence suggested that the gunman was not actually able to use that device, uh, but this would have made the scene far more deadly. And, you know, it really underscores the fact that we're still learning so much new information constantly about what really transpired that day. And, you know, on the question of the police decision to hesitate to enter and confront the gunmen, both the reporting from the New York Times and the reporting from our friends at the Texas Tribune suggests that Chief Police uh, Pete Arredondo and others on the scene that day were essentially making calculations about the risk to their team, to the officers on the scene there, and the about the potential for more loss of life. Uh, although those answers may not satisfy people, you know, as you suggested there. You know, they, they were aware, it appears from the evidence seen by the New York Times, that there were children who were already harmed, already shot in classrooms, while they still decided and, you know, hesitated to make their move. And of course, since Columbine, experts have urged law enforcement to directly confront shooters in these kinds of scenarios. So while they've come out with this defense, 
likely there are going to continue to be serious questions, Savannah. Absolutely. And Antonia, meanwhile, the Texas State House Committee launched its own investigation here into what happened both before, during the shooting. What do we know about this committee? I mean, what's the specific goal here? And can we expect a report to be released? I mean, part of the issue here has been that we haven't gotten a lot of answers. Will we get them here? You know, we're still fighting for answers on so many fronts right now. And while lawmakers launched this investigative effort on Thursday, this committee is chaired by a Republican from Lubbock uh, named Rep. Dustin Burroughs. We aren't going to hear much about it for a while, and that's because this is all going to happen behind closed doors. These are going to be private meetings. They're going to be looking at physical evidence, testimony. They're going to be interviewing witnesses. But we're not going to be able to watch that live. Reporters are not going to be in the room. And so we're really going to have to wait for lawmakers to come and present what they've found to us. Dustin Burroughs has suggested that they may release a preliminary report before the investigation concludes, but even that is not guaranteed. So again, you know, both reporters and of course the community here in Uvalde will be waiting for answers as lawmakers launch this investigation and do it all behind closed doors and without people able to watch Savannah. Absolutely, Antonia, thank you so much, Zach. I want to bring you in here again with these first extended comments that we've heard from the police chief in this interview for, with the Texas Tribune. What's stood out to you about the chief's account of the attack? Were you surprised by any of the details he gave? Did it match with what you heard from families and witnesses? I know there was focus on this key to get in the door. Tell us what you thought about what you learned from him. Good morning, Savannah. One of the things that struck us is Chief Arredondo said he wanted to dispute some of what uh, state officials had said about his conduct, his role during the response to the shooting. Uh, he adamantly disputed the characterization that he was the incident commander in charge of that scene. He said that he was one of the first responders to the scene. He rushed into the school. He was one of the officers that found that the a shooter had barricaded himself into two classrooms, but then he stayed in there in that hallway, uh, ready to engage the shooter if he left the room. Uh, he said he issued no orders to anyone at any time. He did not perform a supervisory role. He did not at any point say that officers should stand down or not engage the shooter. The big problem, as uh, some of the reporting has alluded to, is uh, he did not have access to a key to uh, the school. Um, and that's what was the big holdup in his mind um, to actually confronting the shooter. Uh, they had spent uh, 40 minutes to an hour trying to find uh, keys that would actually fit the classroom door uh, so they could finally confront the shooter. Uh, they ended up getting a big old key ring and trying dozens of keys before they finally found one that worked. Uh, when I talked with uh, police tactics experts about this, they said that they were honestly astonished that um, the school district police, whose primary jurisdiction is this campus, um, did not have the ability to quickly open any door to any room that they needed. Um, and that was a critical mistake that uh, greatly prolonged this incident. Absolutely. Maybe one also that something can be learned from and quite an astonishing detail in your interview there that they had to try so many keys for so long. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's the first time the police chief has given this extended account of the shooting since May 24th. I know you took the chief's account to independent experts for verification to see what they thought about this, about the details he provided, what the failures were. What did they have to say about his version of the attack? Uh, they had uh, raised some criticisms of it. Uh, one of the experts said, um, with regard to why Chief Arredondo stayed in the hallway, stayed right on the front line instead of uh, going back outside to sort of uh, assume a command role. He said, like, he understood the instinct for officers and police chiefs to want to be the one to confront the shooter. But they said police, uh, and especially people in command roles, like, have to override that instinct and do what they are trained. And in this case, uh, the experts felt that uh, Arredondo and other police leaders missed opportunities, especially once they realized that those classroom doors were locked, uh, to regroup, to think yeah. about different strategies they could pursue to get into that classroom, including perhaps breaking windows, including other ways of perhaps getting in, uh, instead of wasting in their mind uh, so much time looking for a key. Yeah. And an important check that you did there, given how much back and forth there's been in these accounts of what happened that day. Zach Despar, Antonia Hilton, thank you so much for your time this morning. The cost of living is on the rise with high gas prices and inflation at all time highs. Many Americans are wondering how long it's going to last. The Consumer Price Index report for May is out this morning, but 
For most Americans, the numbers that really matter are the ones they're seeing on the price tags at the store. So far, we've seen prices rising dramatically with energy, food, rent, and health care costs all spiking. Caleb Silver, editor-in-chief at, Investo at Investopedia, joins us now to break it all down. Caleb, good to have you with us again. So there's a lot behind the rising inflation. What are some of the big forces that are driving this increase? And do we know when consumers can expect at least a little relief? Yeah, every single day we're looking at higher prices, whether it's at the, the gas tank or whether it's at the supermarket. And the food component is a very big one because we can't avoid filling our fridge. We can't avoid filling the tank. But food prices alone are up 10 percent. Let me give you some perspective. For the past 70 years, food prices rise an average of about 3 to 3.5 three percent a year. Even though that's the cost of living increase, a 10 percent rise in the cost of food, that's very impactful for Americans, especially low-income Americans. So food prices are driven by energy prices, right? We need fertilizer costs, transport costs, et cetera. Food is really a big component in inflation. And consumers think inflation is going to be about 5.5% for the next 12 months and then ease to about 3 to 4% for the next two or three years. And, of course, the thing we keep talking about, gas prices, the national average is around $5 a gallon right now. It's expected to only go higher. That's frustrating drivers. It's frustrating companies. And some are wondering if oil companies are just taking advantage of the situation because many of them recently reported record profits. So is there any validity to this? Is there anything those oil companies could do to make things easier? for the average driver? Well, what were we saying when oil prices were negative a year or two years ago, that they were gouging themselves? So when prices rise like this because of an increase in demand, because of tight supplies, everyone likes to blame the oil companies because they are making record profits, $44 billion in profits in just the last quarter. But a year ago, they were losing money because oil prices were so low and they were having so much trouble in terms of their costs. So everybody likes to blame, uh, point the finger at oil, at oil companies when you see these high prices and high gas prices. They are really taking advantage of the market right now and the fact that demand is so intense. That said, OPEC and OPEC Plus, which are the big cartels that control a lot of oil production, they have kept production relatively low, and U.S. refineries have really not come back online like they were back in 2019 pre-pandemic. It's expensive to get those refineries back online, and they're not sure if demand's going to stay. So everyone likes to point the finger. Usually not the case. Caleb Silver, as always, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Now, today marks six months since tornadoes tore through western Kentucky, killing 80 people and leveling entire towns. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow visited Mayfield, Kentucky, one of the towns hit hardest by the storm then and now to see how they're recovering. Hey, Kate, good morning. So I know you were there six months ago reporting on the devastation. The images were just just stunning. What does Mayfield look like now? How are they doing? Yeah, and you know what, Savannah? We so rarely go back, right? Mm. We, we go and we cover these tornadoes, and we don't often get the chance to go back. So it was really something to go back last week and see what has changed, and a lot has changed. The biggest thing you notice when you, when you go to Mayfield is the downtown was really destroyed. I don't know if you remember those images mm -hmm. of just every building in that beautiful little town square, very classic old 50s-style downtown. Now, some of those buildings are still standing, but a lot of the area is just cleared of all the rubble. So they have done a good job in, in clearing things out. I will say they're prioritizing homes for people to get residents back in homes and not prioritizing right now the downtown area, which has actually drawn a little bit of criticism. I, I walked around with the mayor, Kathy Stewart Onan, um, and we talked about that criticism, criticism. We talked about the fact that she's hired an urban planner and things are going to take time, but they do want to rebuild. Take a listen to part of our conversation. When you see this, what do you think? I just think historically will always be that, the memory. But just like everything, we wouldn't have chosen this to move forward, to redesign our town, to reinvent ourselves. But nature took that decision for us and, and forced us into this. And I, I still think, believe with, with every fiber of my being that the tornado, although it took so much from us, it also presented us with this opportunity to have a better Mayfield than we ever would have had. 
So some of what they're talking about, Savannah, is building in more green spaces, you mm. know, creating a, a different type of downtown and, and making sure that the buildings, which, which used to be older buildings, will be up to code mm. for, for, you know, God forbid there's ever another tornado. Absolutely. Yeah, certainly an opportunity to think about that safety. I know you also spoke with people who, who chose to stay in Mayfield, continue to live there, even though they lost their yeah. homes or businesses. We heard from so many people who lost both of those things six months ago. What they say about that decision mm. and their hope for the future? I have to say, Savannah, so many people are from Mayfield. They've lived there their entire lives, mm -hmm. right? Like almost everybody mm -hmm. I've talked to in Mayfield has lived there for a long uh -huh. time. So people don't want to leave. Um, and, and there is a big effort right now. Uh, there's one group in particular called Homes and Hope. They're building 16 houses at the moment. They hope to build 100 houses by next year. Uh, volunteer labor, uh, mostly Mennonite and Amish workers coming in and building these homes for free for people. I spoke with Bill and Barbara Patterson. They're going to be the first to move into a new home. It's almost mm. done. Take a listen to, to what they had to say. Everything that we own, I mean, totally, for 50 years we've been married, was in his house in my garage, back, was it back in the backyard. And uh, we lost it. We, we lost it all. I mean, it, they told me the house is not re Buildable. How does it feel to have a house now? Wonderful. Very blessed. Very blessed. I never dreamed I'd have a brand new home, but we are very thankful. Savannah, they had been in that house, the old house, for 35 years. Mm. I have to tell you, the new house is really nice. I walked through it with them. <laughs> they said they don't know what they don't know what they would have done though if they hadn't, if it hadn't been for the generosity mm. of donations. Um, you know, driving this this home building that's going on. Absolutely, in that house, 35 years, married 50 years. Look at that, and so neat to see yeah. that that gratitude. Yeah. You know, coming out of something, of course, like this, that's really hard to find. That Kate Snow, thank you so much, and you can see more on. Mayfield's recovery and Kate's reporting tonight on Nightly News. Thanks, Kate. Let's get a check on your morning news now, weather. Michelle Grossman joins us now. Hi, Michelle. Good morning. Good morning to you both. Happy Friday. And we continue that summer-like pattern. So we're watching severe weather once again today. We have a complex of storms that we're watching early this morning. And we're going to look at the risk for severe weather as we go throughout this Friday. Also watching those triple-digit temperatures in the southwest. So let's look at everything because we have another active weather day today. This is what it looks like on radar. You can see some rain up in the northwest. So we're going to look at some flooding conditions there. That's along with some snow melt with rain falling. And we're going to see the concern for flooding. We're also looking at a front. You can see where it is clearly on the map, stretching from the upper Midwest down to parts of the south central states. And as we go towards the tail end of that cold front, we are looking at some really strong storms early this morning. We do have a severe thunderstorm watch. And we're looking at really heavy rain. We've seen one to two inches with these uh, storms. And that's what we're going to continue to see again, a really summer-like type weather pattern where we see that rain, kind of torrential rainfall with some of these storms. Seeing that lightning, hearing that thunder, seeing those darker colors indicating where that heavy rain is falling. So this this is what we're looking at for this morning into the afternoon hours. It's going to shift a little bit to the east. So now we're included uh, mostly parts of Arkansas into the Gulf Coast states, 9 million people at risk. We're going to see winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. That could cause damage on its own, damaging hail as well. And then we're watching the chance for a few tornadoes, especially where you see that orange color. Uh, so Jackson, you are in the mix there. Now we have saturated grounds. We've been talking about these storms all week long. They kind of are happening in the same spot. So the ground is wet. Any rainfall we're adding to that is going to cause that. Uh, a concern for flash flooding. So we do have a flood threat today uh, in the green. That's your flood watch. A flash flood warning is in red, and that's where you want to really heed any warning. Look at your local officials. Turn around. Don't drown. That's what we say. And just be careful of any standing water. Now let's talk about triple-digit heat once again. Dangerous heat today into tomorrow, really through the weekend, and we don't get much relief next week. So 34 million people impacted from Texas all the way to California. Heat warning, that is in the hot pink there. Las Vegas, Kingman, Phoenix, Tucson, also Palm Springs. You do have a heat warning today because we're going to see temperatures near 114 in some spots. So a weekend scorcher for sure. This is probably an indoor weekend for many, maybe watching uh, some movies. 109 in Las Vegas, 104, you guys, today in El Paso. And it's 113 in Phoenix for your oh. forecasted high. Oh I know. Lots, of, lots of movies and TV shows this weekend there. Yeah, all right. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Ice cream, yep. all that kind of stuff. Michelle, thanks so much. Ooh, see you in a bit. Good. <laughs> 
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.